Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Did you have a good evening last night? Glad to see everybody. Any, uh, anyone just get your, uh, get your breakfast. Come on over. We're going to have a uh, great opportunity here to talk to uh, two uh, fine leaders in the United States. So uh, I'm Steve Barry. I'm the president and CEO of Competitive Carers Association. And on behalf of everyone at CCA, uh, welcome. RCR. Thank you, RCR. Uh, now that we have uh, had our coffee and a little something to eat, uh, thanks to our friends at ZTE who sponsored the breakfast this morning, it's time to get things rolling. I'd like to thank all our Pinnacle sponsors. Uh, for without them, uh, we couldn't have our event. Uh, Ericsson, Huawei, Interop Technologies, Nokia, Rivada, Sprint, T-Mobile, TNS, and ZTE. And a special thanks to Rivada Networks for sponsoring our special guest this morning, Jeb Bush, former governor of Florida, and Martin O'Malley, former governor of Maryland. They are here with us today to talk about the importance of ensuring that public safety officials and consumers can connect during an emergency and emergency situations. And to talk about how carriers and states can collectively work together to achieve this important goal. Both gentlemen have unique first experiences working with responders. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, thank you. I appreciate thank you. it. Good morning. Hi. Yeah, the Clegg likes are a little uh, strong this morning. Uh, let me just kick it off and uh, give everyone a, a um, set uh, space on, uh, you know, not so much what you've been doing for the last uh, 10 years or 20 years, or, but uh, a little about uh, their bona fides. These are the real deal. This, these are governors that, that uh, met, had carried a state and navigated a state through extreme uh, uh, crises. And uh, Governor Bush, I think eight hurricanes, two tropical storms, numerous uh, emergency response uh, requests while you were governor. Governor O'Malley, uh, you know, uh, not only uh, did you uh, serve as a governor, but you was also, he was also a mayor of one of the major East Coast cities with all the uh, difficulties that are associated with a major city. And uh, he's the front door to our nation's capital. Maryland, uh, a very large uh, uh, seashore uh, area and weathered hundreds of storms. And, uh, and so both of them have been tested. They have the experience. Governor Malley also served on the Mayor's and the National Governor's Association uh, Homeland Security Task Force. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say that uh, both of them are extremely qualified, and even even enough to be president of the United States. Thank uh, you. I certainly wouldn't say overqualified, but I would certainly say uh, both gentlemen have uh, uh, served their their nation and their state very well. So why don't we just uh, kick it off and and talk a little about the fact that we've experienced uh, some huge disasters in the last month or so. We've had hurricanes, Florida, Texas. Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, fires in uh, California. As governors, uh, what are the challenges and the opportunities that you see as those places try to rebuild their infrastructure? Go ahead, Martin. Well, the, look, I th Steve, I think we're going, to see, we're, we're going to see more and more huge storms, mega hurricanes, all of the rest. And this era of terror threat and asymmetrical warfare is with us for for a while. So one of the most important things I think that we still have yet to achieve as a country is the ability to communicate with each other reliably when those big events happen. Not five days later, not three weeks later, uh, but I think the big opportunity we have here is to take an all hazards approach to upping our game on, on public safety writ large. I mean, to take an all hazards approach to the fusion centers, the intelligence, but also importantly, the communications and making sure that we actually, we finally deliver on uh, the, I think the number one recommendation and yet the still unrealized uh, promise of the 9-11 commission, which is to have a purpose-built, hardened, interoperable system of communications. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll thank, for, first of all, good morning. Uh, it's a joy to be with you all. Um, go Astros. The, um, 
<laughs> the, uh, there's no one from California here, I'm sure, so a safe, safe territory. The, uh, uh, on August 13th, 2004, Hurricane Charlie hit Punta Gorda, Florida, a beautiful part of our state. And on August 14th, um, our little team flew down from Tallahassee as the winds were subsiding, and I went to the Emergency Operations Center, and seven-eighths of that building's roof was gone. Basically, they were operating, responding to a Cat 4 hurricane in the open air. And uh, no, one, no one's telephones were working. No, no, no cell service. It was basically, the infrastructure was wiped out. The only phone that worked was the one that I brought, which was one of those old BlackBerry satellite phones. I don't know if you remember them. They're about this big, and you could, you could use them on, on, in the air. And that worked barely. So it, it etched into my soul the need to, uh, when you most desperately need hardened infrastructure is right after a storm or when there's a surge of the need for interoperability, a terrorist attack or, or planning for the next one as we, we both had to do. You were mayor, I think, in 9-11, right? And That's I was right. governor. You're starting to think about how to protect your city or protect your state and the need for, for um, just massive preem preemption to be able to, to be ruthlessly um, online so that people can communicate properly was essential. And we, didn't, we weren't up to snuff at that, that point. Uh, but a governor or a mayor needs to be able to be responsible for this stuff, and we, we created an interoperable network uh, that still exists today. And uh, it was hardened because we knew that that was important, because I saw it firsthand. Now, compare that to a Washington approach, where inside the mid-level of a bureaucracy, there's someone that says, you know, Here's the system, take it or leave it. There's no, there's no transparency, there's no accountability. You don't even know who the, know the person is. I can promise you, if a problem occurred after eight hurricanes and four tropical storms in, in Florida during that time, I was held to account. And I think this system, which is so essential, as Martin said, for our, for our national security and for the safety of the citizens that we used to serve, there should be that kind of transparency. And I, I would trust governors of either party all the day, 124-7, than someone who I can remember, I don't know who the person is, I don't know the guy, name yeah. of, the, of the man or woman that is responsible for this, uh, this process that is completely unaccountable. Well, you know, our CCA members, almost 100 wireless carriers in the United States, serving some of the most difficult, the most hard to reach areas in rural America. Now, both of you were governors of states, had incredible growth opportunities, vibrant, you know, uh, intense, uh, uh, populations, but you also had extreme rural areas to cover. And many of those areas have been and, and continue to be served by some of the small rural carriers. So how important is it, number one, to make sure you have high-speed mobile broadband in rural areas, and how important is it to make sure that the governors are, uh, and the state government leaders are part and parcel to that decision of how you get uh, access to uh, emergency services in rural America. Yeah, I, I, would, I would guess that, that Governor Bush and I both agree that, I mean, in this day and age, access to broadband is like access to the highway. I yeah. mean, for small businesses, for learning, for earning, for everything that goes into giving our, our kids uh, an economy with a, a better future, we, we have to connect our people. And in my own state, uh, we were, we were able to make investments in rural broadband. Uh, we were able to take advantage of a, a program as part of the Recovery and Reinvestment Act to, to really complete that. And I think what we have in this, in this offering of public safety broadband, and we were talking a little bit back, back before we came out, so in case you were wondering, uh, this first net opportunity and the decision that states have to make about whether to, to build out and do an RFP for their own system or to go with the pig and the poke that AT&T, the uh, sole designated federal monopoly, is telling us to buy. Uh, is Tell a us really, what you really think. It's <laughs> a really, really uh, important decision, but not just for public safety, because that very uh, desirable, important part of the spectrum can also be used to, to connect our people better in rural areas and to be able to also uh, build out from the strength that so many of, of the members of CCA, by the way, congratulations on 25 years. Thank you. Uh, uh, happy anniversary. Uh, but 
to, to be able to use that unused portion of the spectrum, to be able to realize a return on it for a lot of the people who are no doubt clients and uh, of, of many of your members who are here today is also an economic opportunity. And that's why it's so important that states retain control over that and not just toss it uh, to uh, the sole designated monopoly for the next 25 years on a song. Uh, let's drill down just a little more on this, this choice that are facing governors right now. Uh, you mentioned it. Uh, we're finally getting to um, you know, the recommendations of the 911 Commission. You know, 11 years after the recommendations, Congress passed a, a law in 2012 mm -hmm. creating a first net opportunity to create this emergency responder network. Five years later, uh, FirstNet is created and does an RFP. And so are, you know, how confident are you, uh, are you that, that, that we're going to get this done in a rational, reasonable length of time <laughs> to, the, to the terms and conditions that governors will feel comfortable that they have safety coverage, not only in their state, but for all their um, uh, state responders, but all their constituents. Meanwhile, while you just described the process that is uh, beyond tortoise-like, China's <laughs> already built you know, a high-speed rail system from Tibet to Beijing and, and Beijing to Shanghai and, and um, has built sure. massive amounts of infrastructure and we're still you know, diddling around here. So um, I would, back to the question of who's better able to accelerate something that is of vital national security and public safety, I would say governors are. And let's just do a hypothetical here for a second. Assume a state opts out. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they will stay opted out, but it gives, them, gives the state the chance to ask the questions that I'm sure many people in this audience are asking that they, and haven't gotten any answers to because it goes into the, you know, the black hole of Washington, D.C., where there's no, no, no sunshine, no transparency, uh, no accountability. Uh, this process has been hidden um, from congressional oversight, and it's been hidden from the people that truly matter, which are the, law, the, the first responders in, in all of our communities. And so if you opt out, you'll have a chance then to compare a proposal, not just Rivada's, but others that would make that, would, would you know, fulfill the RFP, and compare it to the, the first net option. And that's where you get a really dynamic kind of discussion. And as it relates to uh, rural economic development, it's essential for, if you look at the, the challenge that rural America faces right now, the one, there's a lot of solutions that are out there that are necessary, but the one that is by far and away uh, essential to get right is to assure that there's broadband access to the farming communities, to, um, to schools in the rural areas, to small businesses across the board. And this provides a huge opportunity right. for your members and, and to partner with the eventual winner of building out this infrastructure. And sharing in the revenue, by the way, which uh, I don't think the other guys are uh, prepared to offer up. Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, a huge uh, decision. I mean. This is a 25-year decision. I mean, the opt-in, opt-out, right. when you make that decision, I mean, that's a 25-year commitment that you've made that someone else will control and operate and maintain and build a network for emergency responders. And just to sort of get this in proportionality, 1992, 25 years ago, uh, your father was president, uh, and uh, there was no internet browser. There was no Google, there was no Amazon, there was no Facebook, they didn't exist. Cell and phones were this big and you had to carry a big battery <laughs> on your shoulder, remember? FCC only, the only, the licensed, ones. Uh, only licensed two carriers uh, in an area. Um, you know, how are you going to maintain 20, uh, this is a 25 year commitment that I'm not exactly certain how governors uh, sort of either impose their, their uh, will or their concerns or maintain a network. Yeah. Uh, viability for 25 years? Well, the smarter ones are actually doing the request for proposals. I mean, when I was, we were, we were talking a little bit before we came out. I mean, the notion that, that either of us as governors, in full disclosure, we're both on the board of Rivada uh, and, and proud to be, and we believe that we offer the best, best solution. But if either of us as governors had said, we're going to take this valuable piece of publicly controlled spectrum and toss it without a bid to one person and not have any ability 
to make that, that entity deliver, you know, no privity of contract, no guaranteed return to us, and every apparent telegraphed intention to shove us off of our existing networks and make us pay them, you know, uh, while they take the, the spectrum from us, uh, we'd get in big trouble for that. And in fact, <laughs> a lot of our procurement laws would make that illegal. And yet, under this first net pig in the poke AT&T thing, I mean, they're not subject to disclosure. They'd like to tell you that they can't, they can't tell you anything about the coverage areas because that's uh, proprietary. Uh, they won't tell you when they'll get around to building out the, the hardened network, if ever. Uh, so uh, I, I, a lot of the smarter governors are doing RFPs. Some of their staffs have told them it's just easier to go along, get along, no, no sense fighting Washington. But the smarter ones realize that there will come a time when people want to know, how the hell could you have given that away and not gotten anything back in return? When other states have actually done the RFPs and see that they can create an ongoing revenue. See, this is my third time at this rodeo. As governors twice, we beat back attempts by two different presidents, one Republican, one Democratic, to simply toss us a one-time real estate deal, this valuable spectrum to AT&T, and then tell us eventually you'll get to us. And we said, wait a minute, time out, hell no. And that's what, why we, you know, that's part of the delay, frankly, but we thought we had gotten it right when Congress said, you've got to give states the ability to look for the best deal and do it with openness and transparency. But that's not what happens. Uh, that's not what has happened to date. And hopefully some of these smarter governors uh, will lead the way. Well, and, and I might add, some are Democrats and some are Republicans. Right. Yeah, look, and, the, well, one and, of the things, know, Governor Sununu just yesterday sent a letter, uh, you know, hitting some of those issues. Your, yeah, he, your he, thoughts on that? He basically said, press the pause button. There are a lot of questions related to there's a penalty in the, in the contract that is so onerous that no one could legitimately opt out, which, again, creates this um, unaccountable, non-transparent uh, system where no questions will ever be answered. So the questions that are in the here and now are relevant for sure about, uh, about access, um, about the uh, quality of the infrastructure, about the reliability of the infrastructure. But to your point, I mean, the world is moving at warp speed. And if you can't have a conversation about what the, what the network should look like five years from now or 10 years from now or mm. 25 years from now, no one in this room can fully appreciate what that looks like. But we need to have that conversation and the contract needs to have, uh, it, it needs to be dynamic enough and, and the, the ultimate uh, winners of these contracts need to be held to account to future governors so that uh, it's, it's constantly changing with the technologies that are available. Can I and just for the record, I want to make sure um, I, I'm, I'm an AT&T client, and I'm not the guy bashing AT&T, or I don't want to lose my cell phone service. Just <laughs> I'm Verizon. I'm just for. I'm, I'm just for. Uh, we have, I'm just we for, have some uh, choices and opportunities out here. I know. They would like to. Like to if I lose you. my service, uh, it's Jeb at Jeb.org. My email address. If you're looking for a new customer. <laughs> can I can I have one little point to that? And it is the rise of smart cities and the Internet of Things yeah. and the degree to which both states, no, not both, uh, states, cities, counties are going to be deploying sensors that will need to be Absolutely. a part of government and governing and public safety. You look at just policing in terms of shot spot. I mean, what is it called? Uh, yeah, shot spotter. And, and some of the other uh, technologies that are coming online. I mean, this is clearly public spectrum, and we need to make sure that it's reserved for public control. So, so if you're a governor, you're an emergency responder, you're a police uh, fire rescue, and uh, you know, there, there's been deployed uh, the shot sensor technology. It's, it's not uh, of the uh, highest quality now, but they're developing and it's going to get better so all the time. If, if in a city or a town, you, you want to make sure that that sensor capability is not only built in, but your emergency responders have access to it real time. How do you make sure as in, under this process, how would you make sure that that network incorporates those type of capabilities uh, for the benefit of the uh, emergency responder community? Uh, how, you, what put is the it in, you put that in the terms of the RFP. Yeah. And, and if you do, I mean, we'd be glad to, to respond. Um, I mean, I think that's the answer to, to, to flipping it. You have no guarantee if you go with the, what's currently being shoved yeah. down people's throats with AT&T. 
Well, one of the greatest strengths of the country, as <laughs> is, 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 you know, is that the, the states, states can innovate, innovate, they can experiment, they can try things that are unique to their uh, state, region, locality, uh, more so than the federal government has uh, proven to be able to do. So uh, how do you harness some of this uh, created creativity and, and need at the state level and infuse that into this thought process uh, Look, at the federal level. It, it, simply put, we're a bottom-up country. We're not a top-down country. We're not. We we don't get. We're not very good at getting in line and being told what to do. And particularly if it's from Washington, there's a natural resistance to that. And the best kind of approach is one that is completely open and transparent and competitive. Hmm. So states that opt out are given that opportunity to answer these questions by how they structure their negotiations with the ultimate winner. Uh, or they can opt back in. But by opting out, at least, you, you're, you're, you're on equal footing with FirstNet and getting these things answered about what the relationship is today, what the commitment is to, for resiliency in your infrastructure if there's a storm. I mean, the storms that you t talked about, um, they're not going away. The, the fires, the earthquakes, the, the, uh, the, the floods and the, and the wind, we're going to have, every year we're going to have those, and they're going to be all across the country. And if you can't get your infrastructure back up, that's the time when you need first responders' capabilities to be uh, ruthlessly um, available. I mean, without exception, no, and, and preempting everything else. Well, if the infrastructure's down because you didn't negotiate a real commitment to make sure that that infrastructure was, was available when we need it, you know, this, this, is, all not, this is all for naught. So, Opening this process up to allow for uh, proper negotiation will force um, the federal government to get its part right as well. Sunshine. Sunshine to the great elixir, you know, against corruption, inefficiency, ineffectiveness. The crazy thing right now is that if as a governor you haven't done a request for a proposal, you've been given what you're told by FirstNet is a top secret document. <laughs> And you're not allowed to reveal what the coverage is, where they plan to build, what they are going to force your public safety people to pay. They're, we're told, they're, all the governors are told, you can't tell anybody that. And you also can't tell him how we're threatening you with a billion dollar fine if you don't deliver by a date certain something the federal government hasn't been able to get the hitch out of its get along to get done a in 11 a, years. A, a billion dollar fine for? That's what's being threatened. I, I think it's absolutely, utterly unconstitutional. <laughs> and uh, the fact that it was adopted by FirstNet uh, without any sort of openness and, and without abiding by, yeah. by basic rules of procedure and administrative <clears throat> procedure. And that's why there's congressional oversight hearings on this. This was not what Congress intended. Congress intended governors to be able to make the best decision for their people. And the governors that are doing requests for proposals are able to say, look, check, check, check. This proposal did the things we asked for, this other one did not. And that's why this, the openness that Governor Bush talked about is so very important. And whatever decision governors ultimately make. In fairness, Steve, there may be some states, if they've got more mountains than people, where it might make sense to go with the, uh, uh, with the federal kind of fallback proposal. But it doesn't make sense for most states to give up this valuable spectrum and control for so public safety. Martin, answer this. Uh, I'm, I've been gone a while from being governor, but I don't think that the the contract that the federal government has uh, has put forth uh, with FirstNet that has all of this opaqueness around it would be allowed by law in the state of Florida. Is it the same Ooh. in Maryland? I mean, you can't. You I couldn't, couldn't have a contract that had no openness to it where people couldn't uh, use the Administrative Procedures Act to challenge it or to have um, uh, full disclosure. I mean, the, the first responders in the state of Florida would demand it and the law would back them up. I mean, why is, then, is, that, is, that just, is that a Florida thing or is that every state? I think it's every, every state. I couldn't, have, I couldn't have gotten away with doing this sort of third world thuggery that we're seeing from FirstNet on, on this deal. Oh, wow. I mean, this is... Here we go. I mean, it's really outrageous. <laughs> Taking it up another notch there. <laughs> it's, I mean, with all due respect to our neighbors in the third world, uh, the, I mean, we wouldn't have gotten away with this. It's outrageous, really. And, and I, I don't think Congress is going to tolerate this. I think uh, people would be pretty, 
members of Congress that have some memory uh, right. will, I think, be, uh, are, are not going to tolerate this sort of, uh, uh, this sort of quasi-independent, whatever the hell they call it, run amok. I mean, they can't run amok of the U.S. Constitution. It's outrageous. Wow. Steve, well, you just got a call to your cell phone from some, I, one of the thugs I, in Washington I, saying, what the hell's going on on the stage? I, well, and, They're all fine look, individuals here. Yeah, and then some of the things that are happening is you're seeing people that were involved in the decision-making and telling their governors, hey, look, just go along, get along. And that's in, in many, many states, people that are involved in the process suddenly wind up on AT&T's payroll like within three weeks after the decision is I made. I read that somewhere so. else. Well, bring it back maybe a little local for CCA, you know, because our carriers service, you know, a lot of areas that <clears throat> if it hasn't been built out in the last 25 or 30 years, chances are there's a reason that there's mm -hmm. maybe not a lot of gold in them there hills for <laughs> some of the largest carriers. But uh, some of these smaller carriers have actually, you know, done yeoman's work in, in providing those services, particularly in the rural areas. And uh, many of our members tell me that they're concerned about FirstNet's national contractor, that they'll use the federal funds, $7 billion, roughly $6.5-$7 billion, to overbuild them. Uh, rather than utilizing the networks and the facilities that they already have in place. And you mentioned Congress. Congress, when they enacted uh, the 2012 law, uh, uh, directed that to the maximum extent economically desirable, there be partnerships with existing commercial carriers cost effectively to utilize existing networks to speed deployment. Now, to me, uh, that tells me that Congress had a concept that that we were going to waste money by overbuilding uh, capability that's already out there. And oh, by the way, uh, this is a federal you know, uh, subsidy for uh, a competitor to overbuild you. I mean, hmm. transparency in the governor's role in this has always been uh, sort, of, sort of the protection that uh, the free market and the commercial market has. Uh, your comments on that? Well, our bid. Uh the, the strategy for Rivada, and I assume for other uh, competitors uh, for states that opt out, is to partner, is to take the existing infrastructure and figure out ways to enhance it for the needs of uh, firefighters and police, both state and local and, and county level, first and foremost, because that's the first priority. But then the benefit of that could accrue to the partners for economic development purposes, for faster service, for all the things that people should expect, uh, and to bring some equity between the large urban areas that already have this infrastructure in place and, and rural areas. Uh, the Rivada strategy requires a partnership um, because Rivada doesn't have the infrastructure in place that they could build on. And revenue sharing. And revenue sharing. Which you won't get from AT&T. <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, this. Could we talk just a little about the Rivada you know, proposal? I mean, it's a, it's an alternative out there, which, uh, unless you are access, you know, if you have access to the NDA and to the terms and conditions that mm -hmm. are currently being offered governors, it makes it a little more difficult to evaluate your options that you have. But can we talk just a little about some of the, the concepts that the you know philosophical concept that Rivada has used in approaching this with uh, the states? Sure. Can I take a, a whack yeah. at this one first? I guess what I, what I found exciting about this was um, the elegant solution it provides to not only the Rivada solution to not only build out finally a purpose-built, hardened, secure network for public safety. But also, instead of treating this valuable public safety spectrum as if it's a one-time real estate deal, instead we realize that the value, that the demand for this spectrum is only going to increase over time with the Internet of Things and the sensors and the other um, uh, aspects we, we spoke about. And so as the value of that goes up, the revenue from that should go up if we commoditize that and actually cut the states in on the revenue sharing and partners in on that so that the states themselves can upgrade that last, you know, in the police cars or, uh, or, or in the, your fire apparatus. So what I found attractive and compelling about Rivada's proposal is it gives us a way to actually fund and maintain uh, public safety interoperability 
and it makes sure that the, the evergreen fund, anyway, continues, that the value of that continues to inure to the benefit of the public and public safety, as well as Bravada and the other partners that are involved in this as uh, demand grows and the revenues grow. Well, you know, and it's your quote, I think, uh, taken from you, traditionally emergency response plans are built from the ground up. And this one I think may not Governor be Bush who said that. Yeah. <laughs> this one may not be from the ground up. It, no, it's uh, definitely. Oh, this is not ground up. This is uh, from Mount Washington, D.C., lightning bolts being sent down. Um, but the commoditization of spectrum is, is a powerful idea, if you think about it, because uh, we're going to 5G, and I don't know, 10 years from now, they'll be probably skip over 6G, go to you know, 8G or whatever, and the, the need for spectrum is only going to grow. And to commoditize it brings an efficiency, if you create a market around this, uh, that there's all sorts of creative uses that could be brought to bear that in partnership with Rivada, should we win um, this state by state with, with uh, you all and with uh, the states, you, you create a huge economic driver, but also a revenue stream that is uh, recurring that allows you to invest in the infrastructure going forward. That is a big deal because, again, we don't know what the world looks like 10 years from now. I just know it's going to be different and the infrastructure requirements will be different as well. You know, one of the <clears throat> things that our members know all too well is, um, and we have this ongoing debate with Washington, D.C., uh, about the accuracy of the data that is used for uh, USF, Mobility Fund to right. CAF. And, um, you know, the FCC has, uh, I think, done a, a great job of revisiting uh, the accuracy, especially the 477 form data. Um, but many of our carriers are concerned that right now we're having, uh, here's the expert agency, uh, that is trying to decide how do you define unserved and underserved areas, uh, but yet we're looking at NTIA and FirstNet and their contractor, uh, very concerned about how will they measure served and unserved areas? How, how do we get the data and information right if, if the states are not part of that process? I mean, it, if the state will know whether emergency responders is actually getting the service they mm -hmm. need in a certain area. Uh, we're not particularly sanguine that that the data that is being used is actually going to be uh, all that accurate to begin with. You you go to the the web, the map, on the FirstNet map, and you look at it, and it looks like 98 percent to 99 yeah. percent of the United States is already covered. It looks like the job's done. And it's our, not. Our guys know a lot better than that. Um, I don't know how you get to, the, those are some of the fundamental nuts you opt and out. Uh, the answer is simple. It's you opt out and then you create a competitive environment where these are answered at the state level. And you, then you say, look, at, we've negotiated this. You're giving us half of this or whatever it is. Uh, and you create a competitive situation. It, it, procurement can't be done sole source like this without any transparency and get, you get a, and get, and get a good result. So. The opt-out provision, whoever came up with it, was brilliant in the sense that it does provide this second look uh, that otherwise, you know, this would be a moot point. Now, you know, it's, say you opt out and um, then you go through the opt-out process. We're talking about 180 to 240 days before you'll know whether you successfully opt out, i.e. before the FCC, the NTIA uh, accepts your plan as a state as being a qualified plan, the way I understand it. I mean, I don't know what happens in that year, essentially, where you're uh, trying to opt out, you're trying to get the, you know, your options as a state governor, you're, you're trying to make the best decision, uh, but yet uh, you don't really know what the final outcome is going to be uh, from the federal uh, agencies that are going to ultimately review your plan. Yeah, you kind of hear two different things right now. NTIA's folks have been saying any state that wants to opt out and goes through this and has a, a, a plan to make it happen, they want that, that state to be successful and will help them. Uh, FirstNet's another story. That it's like they've become an appendage of, of AT&T. Uh, Congress, however, I think ultimately is going to have a lot to say about this, and those oversight hearings are going to I think start next week. I think you were Yeah, I think no, just uh, announced last night, uh, uh, Chairman Blackburn has announced uh, an oversight, uh, oversight hearing in November 1, I think it is, mm -hmm. a, a one, one day short of a week from now. 
And you know, um, you were talking about the coverage. Uh, we actually went down to a very granular level in Ravada's proposals for all 50 states. That was something AT&T never did. Uh, it's, it's, it seems obvious to many that when you read between the lines and you see how, uh, 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 how unforthcoming uh, AT&T has been about their coverage areas, that their plan's pretty simple. They want this spectrum they know they can get it cheap, and then they want to force everybody else onto their network and call it genuflect when you say, you know, national interoperability. They want to call their network the national network and push everybody to it while they pocket the spectrum that should actually be retained by we the people. Yeah, I, um, you know, again, getting on, on the commercial side of it, um, I'm very concerned about uh, what happens when, even when you do get, you know, we work very hard to get a 15% requirement on rural uh, coverage partnering. I don't even know if that's still in the final RFP. And I mean, I've talked to a couple of attorneys that think it probably is because Congress wanted it. But, uh, <clears throat> but those carriers that uh, actually work with AT&T to build that network, We'll have to build the RAN. We'll build the terms and conditions of the of the of the build. They have a limited number of uh, subcontractors they can use. We have almost 175 um, vendors slash associate members here. They make the uh, sort of the backbone of the infrastructure, the ecosystem for these small carriers. And you know the the impact on this. I mean, they're all small. A lot of them are very small. You know, businesses. The impact of this is going to reverberate throughout the telecom world. We're going to uh, there's, there's going to be opportunities that normally would exist to build that will go to literally only a specified group of people right. that AT&T wanted to build. It. And that was not congressional intent. I think that language you talk about is in the federal statute, isn't it? On the, the, the no, 15%. the 15% the uh, was in the original RFP. I don't know where it is now. I don't know if someone else wants to uh, correct us. But well, this is why congressional oversight is important because there's a lot of questions. The contract that uh, FirstNet is requiring states to sign for opting out has penalties attached to it that is roughly, if you opt out and then you, um, the vendor that you select doesn't fulfill their part of the bargain, you want to opt back in, the penalty is greater than the investment in the infrastructure. I mean, these are, Outrageous. these are, no, no person, no entity could sign a contract like that, and that's certainly not uh, the congressional intent. So these hearings need to be brought to bear to bring a greater transparency. And I don't want to be beating the same drum over and over again, but at the state level, this doesn't, we don't have this kind of secrecy. Sometimes I wish we did, you know? It'd be a lot more fun to be a dictator, but the simple fact is <laughs> democracy works. <laughs> democracy works in, in, you know, we Florida is the, Sunshine State, not because we have, oh, just because we have sun, but we have laws that require total airing of all these things um, and, and making sure all the uh, parties ha have their voice heard. It does add you know, extra time, but look, this process that is completely unaccountable and transparent has been going on longer than my grandchildren have been alive. So, you know, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't seem like it's very efficient that way either. I'll tell you, one of the, we were talking earlier about the congressional intent, you know, build out from strength, build out from existing networks, partnerships, collaboration. Some of the public safety people in big areas, like in, in Los Angeles, they've spent a fair amount of money you know, building out their own network of interoperability. And now they're being told in closed door meetings where they're supposedly not supposed to be able to talk about it afterwards, that no, you guys are gonna have to abandon your network and we're gonna shove you over to the AT&T network because that's now the national network. It's, uh, and that's, that's not what Congress intended. Uh, we're, we're better than that as a people too. So um, I, I'm, I'm confident that more states will do RFPs. I'm confident that Congress will actually reassert uh, its intent in this and public safety joining together with um, you know uh, uh, with other entities is going to carry the day so let me <clears throat> I, you read in the press and media that like 27 states have opted in so what i'm hearing is that it's if a state has said i've opted in it's not over i mean it's uh, not over it, and so for the small carriers and and those competitive carriers and vendors and suppliers that are out there that that want some of this transparency, they want a little more uh, 
um, you know, uh, I think uh, responsibility, uh, uh, accountability, accountability, um, control. What what if where, what do they do now? Do they do the governor still have an opportunity here to to if they said they opted in, do, do, do they can they still change their mind or do, can they say hold it? I, I may opt in. It may make a lot of sense uh, in our states, but I, I want to find out what my options are. Yeah, AT and T went around and started bum rushing these like letters of intent that some governor signed off on, not even truly understanding what it was that they were they were sending in. So governors can still have the ability to do the RFP, and uh, the default position is that they fall back to opting in. That's how I understand it. And it's I think to the end of the year. Yeah, so if you yeah. if your governor, I mean, talking to your own governor and telling him or her, look, you can't give away this valuable piece of of public spectrum without at least doing an RFP, so you can compare the federal monopoly offer to a competitive bid. The the other thing I'd say is that the world is awash with capital seeking uh, infrastructure funding long term. In infrastructure, literally trillions of dollars teed up globally, uh, and this this is a huge opportunity to invest in modern 21st century infrastructure, uh, particularly in the rural areas that are underserved. So, uh, the opting out process is going to create a dynamic um, opportunity for a surge of investment in the communities that you serve. Um, and I think it'll be far better than the first net proposal. But back to the point, if it isn't, governors can opt back in. But the only way to, to determine whether one, one side is better than the other is to actually have, uh, it's not an elegant solution because you have you know, two different processes going on at the same time, but at least you create a much more dynamic competitive environment than what's going on now, which is you'll do it this way, total, no transparency, no accountability, don't ask questions, get in line, sign the agreement. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it sounds like uh, a little transparency, a little sunshine, uh, disinfectant uh, would uh, at least answer a lot of questions. Now, you know, it, it's a tough job. FirstNet had a f tough job. They accepted a tough job uh, to try to bring this together. Um, it's. Um, and they've been here. We've had FirstNet. Uh, they didn't come this year, but they, they've been here for the last, I guess, almost two years talking about this. Um, we, had, we were very hopeful that there would be more involvement with those people that are out there right now serving uh, emergency responders. I mean, the question, do you think your state emergency responders would rather stay with someone they currently uh, have a trust in and actually currently have relationships with? or move uh, cold turkey to someone else uh, promising a network that may or may not get built uh, in a time frame uh, to serve that rural area. Uh, sounds to me like you may not have that choice. Yeah, so you're, you're, you answered your question with your question. Of course, law enforcement, uh, first responders want to see what the options are. They may, they may like their legacy systems and want to stick with it, uh, but I know for sure what they want. They want an adaptable system with new technologies that come to the, come to the forefront five years from now. They don't want to be stuck with a legacy system that looks more like that cell phone this big and a battery pack. They want something that uh, will allow them to do their jobs and keep us safe. So um, you don't get that unless you opt out and have this conversation. And you don't to get Governor it. Bush's initial point, I mean, that's why state control is so important. I mean, he, uh, what public safety wants is to be able to know that they can call somebody that they know that will return their call when they're experiencing problems or when they need new capacities. And you won't get that, not, not from the sort of faceless bureaucracy that we've been, that, that has demonstrated itself so far in this process. You will get that if your state remains in control and your governor has that control. And that's really the basis of all security, isn't it? It's the relationships right. uh, at the local level. And, and uh, so anyway, it's been awesome. Well, with it you. sounds like the, you know, time's running, uh, a lot of un, unanswered questions, and, but we do have an opportunity uh, to, to learn a little more about this. And we mentioned time. I think we just uh, hit our budget here on uh, the time this morning. Uh, listen, it's been great. Uh, thank you so very thank much. You, Steve. Thank you, We yes, really thanks. appreciate it. Everyone. Thank you. Governor. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so very much.
safe Thank travels. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. <laughs> uh, could we use that term for with one of you guys pretty soon? Okay. Right. Hey, Mr. President. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, that, oh.